Good afternoon, once again. Um, is this mic on? Yeah, just move it down. Okay, there. That's better. I was afraid of it before I had to back off. Now I need to move it in. So thank you uh, for staying with us this afternoon, and, and for those of you who, who have joined us in progress, uh, this is Humanities as a Vocation, Career Paths Beyond the Blackboard. And for the second half of the afternoon, it's my pleasure to introduce two guests, both of whom are alumni of, uh, are alumnuses, alumni of UCSB Gauchos. Uh, we have uh, um, on the left, Reza Aslan, a public intellectual who many of you are familiar with. If you were with us last night, you uh, were treated to a, a brilliant, brilliant performance around um, his latest book, God, a Human History, and here he is with his uh, progeny, <laughs> reproductive uh, work, a lovely, lovely son. Um, uh, Reza is visionary and has um, produced and written uh, several uh, television uh, uh, projects, including a documentary series um, that was on CNN for its first season last year called Believer. Uh, we're going to learn more about Reza's uh, work on that project this afternoon. He's also the author of several books uh, besides God of Human History, including Zealot, The Life and Times of Jesus of Nazareth, which was a number one, uh, was, had the number one position on the NY, New York Times bestseller list uh, when it uh, was published and has been uh, translated into several languages and sold around the world. It's also been optioned by Lionsgate, so I'd like to hear more about that, uh, if Reza would uh, care to talk about that this afternoon. Uh, what's in future? What do we have in store for Zealot? Um, and he uh, also has thought uh, and has been a commentator uh, in uh, media and has thought long and hard about the role the university can play in preparing um, the next generation of public scholars. He's a tenured professor at UC Riverside in teaching creative writing. So I think I'd like to begin at that point and ask Reza if you could respond to this question. Uh, what uh, role does creative writing play in um, producing uh, public scholarship on religion? Thanks, Kathy. Uh, oh, there I am. Hi. Um, yeah, I think, you know, for me, Spending uh, two years of my academic career going off and, and getting an MFA in fiction was probably the most important decision um, I made because what I learned in that process was how to communicate ideas, um, particularly complex ideas, in ways that are accessible and appealing. Um, and more importantly, how to weave stories out of um, thoughts and out of ideas. And that's a an very important um, skill to learn regardless of what field you're in. After all, stories are how we understand the universe. It's how we understand our place um, in the world. Um, it's always <laughs> been that way. Um, and it, I think being able to construct ideas, concepts, through the lens of storytelling um, allows not just for a, a much more um, widespread dissemination of your ideas, but it, I think, allows for them to be absorbed and retained far more so, uh, as any teacher in the room will tell you, um, than just simply facts and figures and dates. Now, in my field, of course, religion and politics, these are both just storytelling mechanisms. I mean, religion is just storytelling. Politics is just storytelling. So it lends itself much more readily to those things. Um, but I believe that this is true regardless of what field you're in, whether it's medicine or biology or certainly the law. Um, you know, taking the, the time and the effort necessary to, to understand how to construct an effective narrative is probably the, the most important skill that you could um, uh, attain, and that certainly has been the case with me. And then I wanted to also introduce uh, our second guest, Tim Kring, who uh, is a graduate of UCSB and majored in religious studies. Tim Kring is a screenwriter and a television producer who may be best known for producing such series as Heroes and Heroes Reborn. Now I want to ask you, Tim, uh, after your undergraduate education, you also got a master's 
if you could talk about uh, I, the role, your perspective on so creative forward. writing and the ah. importance of developing writing skills. Ah, yeah. <laughs> like Tony and Tennille. Yeah. Um, uh, well, you know, I didn't really know how to write uh, until I start until I became a religious studies major, and for for whatever reason, I was really drawn to. Um, it's funny, I mean, when we were talking earlier about academic writing versus sort of more prose writing, I chose to, to be as kind of creative as I, as I could in all of my papers that I wrote here, and I kind of honed a lot of story. I, I, I actually wrote uh, scripts <laughs> that I turned in for papers and things like that. So, um, you know, I was actually exploring the whole idea of of creative writing as an undergraduate here. Um, but I, you know, I, I see the whole, um, I'm sorry, I've sort of lost, the, the, the question was how do I see? Creative writing, a writing skill is, uh, you know, part of uh, your tool set. Well, I mean, right now it's all, it's, it's, it's the dominant uh, skill set that I need. Um, <laughs> without it, I, you know, I wouldn't, I would not have a career, so. Um, and and I again I do see the the link between my undergraduate you know the the uh, the learning to um, to ask the right questions uh, I I sort of associate a lot of that you know sort of basic humanities uh, education with with knowing how to write the uh, how to ask the right questions while I'm while I'm while I'm writing and exploring, um, sort of, you know, exploring big ideas from multiple angles and and you know the sort of critical thinking that it takes. Um, so so for me, you know, writing is my stock and trade. And I wonder if uh, going back to Raisa again and talk about the, uh, you know, Tom, uh, sorry, Tim was talking about big ideas, and I know, I anticip anticipate a little bit about what Tim is going to be speaking on on the themes, the religious theme. Um, the imp impact of religious studies on developing the themes that he has. I wondered if you could talk about content production, you know, um, how you uh, generate your idea for something like a documentary series. Well, uh, first let me say I think that, um, you know, part of the reason why Tim and I were both drawn to the study of religion and then from there went on to, you know, just telling larger stories um, is because when you study religions, what you are really delving into is the process of myth making and you know myths are the stories that have survived for thousands of years not because they are quote unquote true but because they are meaningful and so when you study these this kind of myth making i mean any what content creator doesn't dream of writing something that lasts 5000 years <laughs> right i mean that's that's incredible so you when you immerse yourself in that kind of storytelling you start to learn um, what it takes to really um, to really hit someone at the heart of the human condition um, and to address issues in metaphorical ways that um, can stand the test of time, that can be malleable, that, I mean, I, th I, th I think of heroes, for instance, as a perfect example. Like, there's no way you would have come up with heroes if you didn't get a no, degree in religion. No, they're, they're, they're very tied to one another. The whole idea of, of, of archetypal storytelling um, that, that I think you understand in, in the deep kind of almost Joseph Campbell w way, um, to be really honest, heroes just completely, you know, lean very heavily into that. And those, those archetypes of, of um, you know, family structures that were in the, that show were right out of, you know, the hero with a thousand faces. Yeah, right. And, and, and so I think that, um, first of all, that's what I think is so appealing about the, the um, study of religion um, because of the, the avenues that it opens up for you in, in that regard. But also I think in, in this case, um, it really does lend itself to uh, creating new myths, new ideas, new, new metaphors that can themselves stand the, the test of time. And so um, it was an enormously valuable for me, and I, certainly it was enormously valuable for Tim. Um, now, uh, you know, some, not all of my focus, but some of my focus is more in the, the kind of nonfiction genre, um, and so, 
for me, uh, sometimes the, the challenge is how to um, tackle these kinds of major themes, but by focusing on real people, real events, real moments in their in their lives. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is that the the process, the craft that's involved in the creation of that content is identical to the craft that's that's involved in something creating something that is wholly fictional. Um, in fact, you know, one of the things that I constantly teach my students is that um, fiction, nonfiction, poetry, these, these are not real genres. There are only two genres of writing, good writing and bad writing. Um, and, uh, and so, I, you know, it, it's all about the process of storytelling. It's all about narrative, regardless of whether it's fiction or nonfiction. You have some examples that you'd like to share with uh, us on the documentary series. Um, sure. Do you want me to? I yeah. can show. Yeah. All right. I'll, You're do I gotta. Do, yeah. I'm gonna have to stand up there and, and right. use this this mic. Um, uh, so um, one of the things I did is I, I did a documentary series for CNN called Believer, in which I immerse myself in in religious traditions, usually marginalized or or misunderstood religious traditions around the world and and through my sort of particip my immersive participation and experience in in these religious communities uh, it was an attempt to kind of um, well de-otherize them if you will so i'm just going to show you um, just one clip from one episode in Haiti and i'm going to have to put this down here you want to keep you want to keep my microphone on Any voodoo ceremony is the drawing of that at all? Each feve corresponds to a particular loa. They act as a kind of spiritual beacon, inviting the spirit to enter the laku. But this is opening the gates for the spirit to make sure that you participate. The hope is that once a spirit finally descends, it will take hold of one of us, though no one really knows who in the room will be mounted. Now we're charging the veve. Okay. Once the veves are charged with offerings of alcohol, the gate to the spirit world can be unlocked and the call to the spirits can begin.
sacrifice is very likely the oldest religious ritual in the world and an important part of many voodoo ceremonies. He's very happy for the offering and the feast that is provided for him. The offering is given to the spirits with hopes of obtaining blessings and good health. Got, it's fun. You, you got. Um, you oh, get, oh, turn that off. Sorry, it's still going. Right. I was going to say you've got um, booze and you've got machetes <laughs> and exactly. you've got fire. Fire. <laughs> and what could go? What could what possibly could go, wrong? go wrong? Yeah, and lots and lots of blood. <laughs> lots of blood. And blood. Um, interestingly, so um, you know, we we sacrificed the goat. But then we sacrificed a pig. Then we sacrificed uh, a, a chicken that I was supposed to um, kill. And I did a terrible, terrible job of doing so. Um, and, and like, you know, none of that, we couldn't show any of that. We, we knew that we wouldn't be able to show any of it. So, but it was, um, it was a profound experience. That entire thing from beginning to end took about 10 or 11 hours. Wow. And so when it's over... I mean, you're just covered in blood and dirt and, and exhausted. You and, just yeah. feel different mm -hmm. as a person. How many episodes did you end up doing? Six. Uh -huh. Yeah, six episodes. Uh, right. We did the voodoo in Haiti. And we did um, the agori in India. In India that's right. um, yeah. We did um, Santa Muerte in Mexico, which was probably my favorite episode. And then we did um, the Haridim in Israel. Uh -huh. uh, we did a. That was this that kind was of. Crazy. <laughs> that was a crazy. We did a, this. Um, very uh, interesting and bizarre doomsday cult in Hawaii. Uh -huh. um, followers yeah, saw, of a, yeah, followers of a messiah named Jesus with mm -hmm. a Z. Um, uh, and then oh, and Scientology. I didn't see the Scientology. We did Scientology, wow. and it was really interesting because even fans of the show who were like, "Okay, Voodoo, Santa Muerte, sure, it's a skull right. and a dress, fine, fine," they were, but they got really upset. Like, but why Scientology? And I think the question itself was the answer. Uh -huh. So, do you want to? Uh, well, I, I well, actually had. Go ahead. I, because it, it sort of this this lends me to. I mean, it sort of leads to the a question that I wanted to talk to you about about the the work that you do and the seriousness of the of the academic nature of your background and the, and the, the rigor of the work that you do that has now <clears throat> migrated for you into um, or, or has a separate uh, track for you between that and the part of you that is actually f in front of, you know, the sort of in the... F in front of it all, the public face of your own yeah. of your own brand. I was just wondering if you could. I mean, I'm, I can't imagine that b being here at, at UCSB, you envisioned that that would be where that would all end up. Um, well, so this this may sound odd, but I most definitely envisioned that that's where it would all end up because that was the plan all along. But what was difficult throughout my entire career was the nonstop 
shit that I got for it from my colleagues, my professors. Um, you know, everybody loved this show except for scholars who hated it and hated it because, uh, because they thought it was simplistic, that it was, you know, that obviously not recognizing that the, that the point of a show like this is to tell a good story and to get people to watch it and to entertain and then quietly sneak some information in while no one is looking. Um, and it took me, to be perfectly honest, a long, long, long time to, um, uh, to make peace with that. Um, because, you know, you, did, you, you spend years and years and years and years in, in pursuit of an academic um, degree, and, you know, it's blood and sweat and tears, and, and then because you don't um, pursue a, a traditional academic uh, line, um, you are immediately dismissed as not real or not a real scholar. And it's annoying and it hurts your feelings. Um, but, you know, I'm at the, I, I, I came to that point where I just thought to myself, it doesn't bother me anymore. I don't, I don't take it seriously as much anymore. It's interesting you said that it was a plan because it's a difficult plan to pull off. I mean, you <laughs> yeah. have to, you know, who knew that, that, that would be, you know, that being on John Stewart or being, <laughs> yeah. or you know, it would would sort of lead to a, a kind of a, a public persona that would allow you the ability to do that. A well, lot of things have to go right. Yeah. Well, you know, I had the same I had the same experience in undergrad as you did. Mm-hmm. I I read Joseph Campbell, I read Houston Smith, and I thought, I want to do this. Yeah. But I feel like if if either of those two guys were around today, they'd be on TV. <laughs> right? Yep. I mean, that's where they yep. would be. That's how they would communicate mm-hmm. um, a- in both uh, fiction and nonfiction, right. right? So, I mean, I think that that's in, in many ways, you know, we were both compelled by the same figures right. to to express, again, the these things that we find interesting. And this is, this is, I think, the funny thing. You and I have had this conversation before. You know, it's a very simple equation. I find this stuff interesting. And I just assume other people will too, right. if they can just have access to it in some way. Um, and it's just about giving them that, that access, I think, so. If I could ask a question and interject there, uh, Razor, with uh, your point made that um, sometimes religious studies professors are uh, your worst detractors. Um, and that's not, and that's aggravating and that's frustrating. Uh, what venue or what um, audience are you uh, able to persuade, or maybe persuasion is not the word I'm looking for, but where do you find the success, and what is your uh, objective in yeah, changing so, hearts and minds? Yeah, I think I think my my overall goal and mission in life is to, as I kind of explained last night, to get people to understand the difference between religion and faith, and to recognize that what religion does as a language is provide a way to communicate universal sentiments. And then if you can just get past that language, then you can have these kinds of connections. And so, you know, the desire is to take either through the writing or through this, this process is to take someone through an experience that they at be, at first begin um, to feel is foreign and frightening um, and unfamiliar and weird and scary and then um, whereas you know in a book I would just kind of write you know everything that you need to know about uh, voodoo and why it's not as weird as you think it is and you don't have that opportunity here it's just it's all about my immersion and as I go through this experience hopefully the viewer is going through it as well and then coming out with a different understanding one that says well, okay, that's not that weird, and actually, I believe something qu- quite similar to that, and that's the audience I think that that um, that I'm focusing on is the audience who is willing to have its mind changed. Um, but you know, it, it, my 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 primary goal is not education. My primary goal is understanding. And Tim, with your work in uh, the creative field. And storytelling, and is there a similarity? Are you also trying to change minds and 
well, promote better understanding? You know, I, I have to say, I my own personal journey is a, um, kind of a long one. Um, I started out, you know, when you work when you work in Hollywood, you you when you first start in Hollywood, you take any job that you can, and um, so you take a million things, million jobs that you you know are not proud of, but you are trying to you know put one foot in front of the other. And I never really had uh, a sense that I could actually, uh, you know, have a, a message that, that, you know, if I could sneak a little something in, it would be great. But I never really thought about, that, about it that much. And it wasn't really until, um, for me, um, a little bit of, of a cliche, I guess, but it was 9-11 that did it for me in an, in an odd way. Um, but it, I'll tell the story quickly. I, we, I had a show on the air uh, called Crossing Jordan, and we were uh, in production during 9/11, and when uh, when when 9/11 hit, we took one day off of production. We came back the following day, um, and you know, I I went into the uh, to the soundstage that we were shooting in, and there I was with you know 150 people, kind of in a day. Everybody was in a daze, and the entire thing felt. All of a sudden, so uh, unreal and so so phony. Every wall that you knocked on was hollow. Uh, people had, you know, the actors have makeup and they're playing characters that aren't really themselves, saying words that aren't really their own. And I, I just had this, you know, uh, odd epiphany that um, none of this is right. There is a world out there that really needs, uh, you know, healing, and we we should be. We should be talking about something. We should be saying something more than just this kind of, you know, it's it's all well and good to entertain, but right now I'm really feeling the need to to say something. The problem is I wasn't sure what to say and not sure what to say with this particular show. So what ended up coming out for me out of it was a single episode that changed everything for for me as a writer. It was an episode of a that basically dealt with the idea of interconnectivity. It was a daisy chain of a story that where things were connected in very strange metaphysical and spiritual kind of ways to one another. And um, and I realized that I, with that one episode of television, that I was uh, very interested in the idea of interconnectivity, that that was something that I had, um, had always felt uh, it was part of why I became a religious, religious studies major. I was thinking about these things. And I felt sort of uh, finally for the first time I, I, I had a, an issue. I was sort of like a one-issue candidate, you know. This is what I wanted to talk about. So I then created the show Heroes based on the idea of wanting to talk about interconnectivity. Um, and so the, the entire theme of that show is, was that. And the, the next show that I did was a show called Touch. And that show didn't use the theme of interconnectivity. It actually made the, the idea of interconnectivity the premise. The entire show was about, uh, it was, the subtitle of the show was Tales of the Red Thread. And if you know the, the myth of the red thread, that you know, um, we're sort of all connected by a red thread to one another. So, so that that is the issue that I have been dealing with for a, about a over a decade now. But I mean, I would say there there is a um, a moral argument that you're making in the theme of interconnectivity, right? That it's not oh yeah, it's oh, not just absolutely. about the fact that we're all no. connected. That there is actually yeah. something to that. If we can find one another and connect, we can save the world. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, that's the the, the 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 yes by by connecting people to one another, um, uh, yeah, you can get twenty people that conspire to fly a plane into a building, of course. But most of the time, good things happen when you connect people from disparate parts of the world to one another. Yeah, there was also a, a lot of, and my work is about global consciousness as well. There's lots of ideas of people from different parts of the world finding one another and converging with one another. There's a story structure that I've explored for years about with disparate stories that mm -hmm. seem disconnected, seem uh, disparate, but somehow are connected and um, you as an audience participates a little bit in that, in, in the mystery of that. In making those connections. In making those connections, yeah, putting it all together. Right, it's 
The, the other thing that I would say about you, Tim, which is really fascinating, um, and we've had this conversation before, is the participatory nature of your storytelling, right? Which again goes back to what we were talking about with regard to mythology, myth making, right? Uh, you know, certainly before these myths are written down, but even after they're written down, these things are living stories. They are constantly changing, right. constantly adapting, depending on the changes in the community, who is telling the story, to whom the story is being told. And what I think is remarkable about you as a storyteller that is, frankly, utterly unique in, in, uh, in, in our business, in, the, in, in, in sort of Hollywood, um, is your comfortableness with allowing other people to actually <laughs> engage right. and sometimes even drive the narrative. And I don't mean other people as in other writers. I mean just other people, like just normal people on the street who you are giving opportunities and avenues to become part of the story, yeah. which I think and is that, extraordinary. That's been really the big progression. Then we'll get back to you, to you but I'll, I'll explain yeah, that. I'll, I'll, I'll unpack that a little bit. Um, you know, when I first started uh, writing uh, t t content and Hollywood television, it was all a, a one-way street between me and the audience. The audience didn't really exist. I pushed content out to the audience sometimes two, three, four months before, I mean, after we make it. And the only, the only sort of... Uh, reaction from the audience was this kind of binary sort of thumbs up, thumbs down based on a Nielsen rating, right? right. And that was how you knew whether the audience liked your, your stuff. Then suddenly the internet happens and the audience now has an immediate uh, feedback loop with, with, with a storyteller. And so suddenly this becomes this dynamic two-way street. And so uh, any modern show on television um, has to be able to reach that an audience on sort of multiple platforms where they live. They, you have to be able to be in contact with them all, all the time. And um, so what that ended up doing for me was just kind of blowing my mind and m making me realize that storytelling was this... I tell story to people, they tell story back. They keep... And so this dynamic loop really um, started to to uh, become, you know, almost addictive to me. Um, I had a clip that I'm not going to show because it's too hard to show. But um, I, eh, it'll take it. I'll, I'll, we'll get to it in a minute. Um, I have this little clip of of walking out onto the. I don't know if you've ever seen this. Walking out onto the stage at Comic Con um, with the entire cast of my, my show, uh, Heroes. And we, we all walk out there, and um, it's a sea of people in one of these giant venues that has, I think, about 8,000 people, you, you know, those big Hall H. And, and if any of, you, any of you have ever been to Comic-Con, it's just a, a crazy experience. So you have these 8,000 screaming fans. And um, I look out into the audience, and there's the whole cast is up there. And in the f first, I don't know, three or four rows, um, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of people dressed in costumes from, of, as characters from the, sh from the show that I created, right? So I'm looking at, you know, cheerleaders and, and little Japanese uh, otaku kind of characters and our, our villain, you know, and, and, um, and these are people that literally came from who knows where. Um, here, I'll, I'll show that, I'll just quickly show that. Um, these people came from like you know you can't imagine from from where they came from, but uh, they spent their you know their hard-earned money. This is if you can see back there how far back it goes. It just it's and there's our entire cast of good-looking people, and then there's me up there standing there. And but anyway, so the point is, the the point of the story is that I saw these people dressed in these costumes in the in front of you know in front of me. And a light bulb sort of went off that these people had stood in line for six hours, um, spent their hard-earned money, somehow got, found their way here, all because of their passion and love for a narrative that 
they, you know, watched in their in their they homes. Just came out of your head. And and the idea being that if you could harness that energy, um, and allow those people to actually participate somehow in a narrative with you, open up the. I'm gonna go back. Uh, open up the 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 narrative to to them in some unique way. Um, I'm, I'm going the wrong way. There, that was the one I was in. Um, this was sort of the, this was kind of the, the motto that we adapted. We had a giant universe and we opened it up to, to the audience and allowed them to come in and they, they ended up pouring in and so they created content with us. We had you know, endless ways to have them create content. They would created videos and mashups and fan fiction and comic books and, you know, just endless amounts of content based on the narrative that we had had created. So we opened up this story world to people and that suddenly became a very dynamic and interesting and exciting idea for me. Um, and out of that came some of the ideas of social benefit storytelling, which is um, a way for you to insert yourself inside of a narrative that ends up having real world positive results, which I can talk about later as well. Uh, I mean, all I'll, all I'll say is, I, I, and I think, um, I think the thing that I would add to that is the unprecedented nature of that kind of storytelling. And I don't mean that just because it's clever. It is clever. It's just that usually people in Tim's position have zero interest in that kind of a relationship with their story. Because, again, I mean, this, you know, it's like birthing a baby and then letting everyone else help you raise it. <laughs> like, yeah. no, now it's your turn to take my baby for a while. That's, that's the significance of what we're talking about here. You know, I, um, um, I remember my, my wife and I, um, years ago, um, participated in uh, Christo, if you know Christo, the, the large-scale performance, I mean, uh, you know, um, installation art. We participated in the... In the um, the umbrellas. Do you remember? Do, does anybody remember that? The the he. I don't know how many miles. Ten, fifteen miles of the I five on the grapevine. These giant yellow umbrellas that were I don't know, fifteen, twenty feet tall. And this is remember it's before the internet, so before social media. And I just remember coming into this um, giant warehouse where all these volunteers for, for sort of an initial kickoff and out comes Christo and this fabulous scarf and his beautiful wife and they give this very inspirational speech about how we're gonna all do this collective crazy thing that has zero meaning. I mean really zero meaning other than the idea of collectively creating art together. And I think that that bug really connected there. I, I, I somehow really loved that idea. And I'll tell you two, two other quick things. I collect um, guitars, ac acoustic guitars. I, I mainly um, sort of one-off. There's many luthiers, that, you know, single guy in a, in, a, in a shop somewhere who makes a beautiful guitar. And I, I'm fascinated by those guitars. But it's the best guitars that I've ever played in my entire life are Martin guitars, which are built in a factory of about 150 people. And 150 people somehow put their fingers on this guitar before it reaches the end of the assembly line. <laughs> and for whatever reason, there's a mojo that you can't duplicate any other way. So that's, that's sort of an another analogy of it. I guess we could ask questions. I mean. yeah. production called Dig. Yes. Are you a screenwriter and producer of that? Show? And so did. Yeah. All right. I want to hear about that. If you could uh, tell me oh, about it was a crazy the plot, experience. story structure, the experience. You know, that's, actually a, yeah. that's actually a really good Should I show that? I, they've got a one minute clip. Let's do, let's yeah. do that. Yeah. yeah. Let's like just show it. it, it because then I, we can talk about it. Because you and I had vastly different experiences yeah. uh, for reasons that will become 
clear in a moment. Let's see, where was it? Uh, I think it's this one here. Well, this will. Th let's yeah. do this first, and then let's see whether. Oops. You don't have to worry about me. I do worry about you. Look, I know what you're thinking. I lost someone close to me. Life is complicated. And let me do my job. Really, it's the only thing that keeps me sane. Well, he was found this morning with two uh, teenagers. It's best if the locals take care of the case. An American citizen has been killed on foreign soil. I gotta find out what happened. I love there's something going on here. You have to trust me. In two days, nothing of this world will exist. The time is now. You have seen things you weren't supposed to see. It was some kind of sacrifice. The people who killed her are planning something that could throw the whole region into chaos. Talk to me and I can protect you. You're a small man. In the end, we mean nothing. Get him under control. I need your badge and gun. Who would die for this? Find him. This thing is bigger than you and me. It's Armageddon. So yeah, so D Dig was a 10-part uh, uh, kind of you know, mini-series or event series. Um, <clears throat> the premise of which was um, this uh, FBI agent who's stationed in, uh, in Jerusalem um, sort of picks the, the thread of a, of ends up because of a single murder discovering this huge apocalyptic um, sort of, uh, you know, conspiracy th scheme uh, with an end of, end of the world, uh, end of world kind of, uh, um, you know, rebuilding the, the temple and bringing about Armageddon and the strange bedfellows of, of an American uh, v very, you know, super sort of um, orthodox kind of right wing a Christian cult mixed with the Orthodox, you know, bring the, bring the, rebuild the temple kind of um, cult in, in Israel, and the two they're conspiring to to bring about the end of the world, and so that was what the the show was about. Well, and and uh, as some people in the room know, that's not a that's not fiction. So there are actually. Uh, I mean, you know, D Ted Hagee, who is one of the most powerful um, Christian uh, evangelical megachurch leaders, uh, is is that guy? Is is that basically that guy right there? Uh, and he, you know, he sits down in the White House with you know presidents going all the way back to Jimmy Carter. The Temple Institute in Israel is aggressively trying to rebuild the third temple precisely to usher in uh, the Messiah and the end times. These two groups are working together for that purpose at least three times in the last 20 years. Attempts to destroy the Dome of the Rock have been foiled. Um, so all of this is like yeah. in the backdrop of very real things, very real things that are happening. And the, and the strange bedfellows of the two, the two, yeah. because their agendas are very different. One is about bringing about the Messiah, and the other one is, yeah, well, the Messiah's already been here, and he's coming back, and when he does, you... Most of you guys are going away. Actually, <laughs> most of you, yeah. yeah so. And by the way, that's Mike Pence. I mean, if you're <laughs> if you if you're confused with yeah. Mike Pence's entire focus of what he, what he's doing and why he's on his way finally now to um, the Holy Land, because that's Mike Pence. Yeah. Mike Pence wants the third temple so that Jesus comes, and the first thing Jesus does is get rid of the Jews. Yeah. Um, but I think what this is a great uh, sort of segue to what we were saying earlier, which is. You know, it's a narrative. Obviously, it's a story. It's entertainment. It's all. It's all about you know telling a good, exciting, and fun story. But in this case, one that is grounded in some real events. 
and then the people who are in any way associated with those real events lost their shit, as you can imagine. Um, and then on top of that was this whole other uh, problem that we faced, which is you know the sort of the Palestinian rights community, who on the one hand were very excited about the theme of the show, which was which is something that they've been yelling about for years and years and years. You know these these crazy temple. Third Temple people, who for whom this is all just some cosmic conflict, and and uh, the entire sort of uh, politics of um, Israel Palestine is seen through the lens of these apocalyptic ideas, but who at the same time were incensed that we were actually filming in Israel. Yeah, <laughs> we we filmed in places um, in in Jerusalem that were, um, you know, not only never film but m never been to by anybody who wasn't you know uh, I mean literally <laughs> some of them some of the places we filmed there are scenes that you saw in that clip that were filmed literally underneath the temple in the um, in some of the, the tunnels places that nobody and then and then and we were filming in East Jerusalem to be really honest <laughs> some sometimes and um, we got shut down a few times by the whole BDS movement. Yeah, and, the, you know. the uh, boycott, yeah. Uh, divestment, sanctions yeah. group. And then, by the way, if all of that wasn't complicated enough, in order to get the kind of permission necessary to, to film this extraordinary stuff, you know, we had to play nice with the, the crazy right-wing government. Mm -hmm. and, and by playing nice with the crazy right-wing government, the, the government, including the mayor of Jerusalem, took advantage of that to make these uh, statements that were completely not authorized by anyone in the production about how, oh, this massive production is, is coming here and the, the production is going to prove that this land belongs only to the Jews and no one else. And we're, thought, we're like, okay, they haven't read the scripts. They obviously have not read the scripts, which is great news that they haven't read the scripts. But then that pissed off the Palestinians more, and then it was just... And then to, to make matters worth, worse, the missiles started flying in the last... Right. Uh, you know, and we, um, we ended up having to pack up and leave Jerusalem. Um, and we finished... Um, we ended up shooting Jerusalem... Um, uh, the towns of Split and Dubrovnik uh, in in um, Croatia, Croatia for for Jerusalem, and then New Mexico for the desert parts of of, of Israel. So, I mean, thankfully, the thankfully the Romans built lots of <laughs> lots of walled, you know, cobblestone cities all over the place, <laughs> and some of them still exist. You know. But it was a it was a, a very very interesting. Uh, project that that really did lean very very heavily onto um religious themes and and some of them pretty you know um a, a little incendiary you know which again sh going back to what we were saying that's when you're dealing with you know religion in a popular way for a popular audience through narrative this is this is the complications that suddenly arise but that's no reason not to do so right. Yeah, sure. And we're going to need to have one of the... Oh, uh, here you go. Yeah. I think it's simply for the recording, so I have to run around, and you can share that one with him. So my question goes back to where you started, and uh, you said that narrative is all about a good story, and then where you get a chance, you weave in a little nugget of understanding that you want to get across. Do you begin the creative process saying, I know what that little piece is and I'm going to write a story around it, or are you writing a story because you've got to get something, copy out there, and then you say, oh, I can get this in there. How does it work for you in your creative processes? Just for me, uh, when it works best for me, when it in the most successful, it comes from a, a very um, deep desire to say something, to have, to hide a message inside of something, and an almost, yeah, I mean, in an almost um, subversive way. Um, we use the phrase in Heroes, in the first season of Heroes, we use the phrase, we are all connected um, exactly 100 times as a mantra. It was sort of like, you know, 
sewing in the phantom thread kind of thing. We wanted that in there. Um, so y you're you're not always lucky enough in Hollywood to to start with that the purity. Um, and I've I've been lucky enough a couple of times to start with with from a very pure place, and it it's a very interesting difference um, in projects because it inculcates you from a lot of the shit that you go through because you you have a you have a true north you have a um, a zealots um, focus uh, that that really. Uh, it really helps when, you know, 300 people, it takes 300 people to, to make a, a big TV show. And you can find it slipping away, you know, uh, with heroes, to be perfectly honest. By the end of the first season, it had slipped away from me. And I, the analogy that I sort of gave, uh, uh, it's like having, as you said, you have a child, you give it up for adoption to a Chinese family, right? And a year later, you see that child, and you recognize it because it looks like you, but it's now speaking Chinese. And that's what ends up happening oftentimes when you, when you hand something over to, you know, when that many people are involved in a project, it can, get, it can start to veer, veer away from you. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And then I, just to say, the second step is to find the vehicle to express the the big idea and what i mean is who's the the character because the stories are about people not about events so you think of the the thing that you want to say um and then the really hard part is who's going to say it hi so this is just going to show my ignorance about this industry but is one, since this is a talk about jobs for PhD students, is one of those 300 people working, um, you know, finding the, a list of the nastiest diseases for Shonda Rhimes or the best talking oh, yeah. heads She's for a PhD? She has a whole department that does that, yeah. And research, research. Okay, yeah. so there are research jobs. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that isn't just production assistants or well, writers. it's usually it's usually a it's usually a writer who okay. is assigned to being you know heavily the research. Per, I mean, on on Dig, you know, the m much of that was your job. Um, not you weren't a researcher, but you provided that as for, you know that's what came with <laughs> with you. Um, but you know, I think of like Sharon Hoffman, who was who was who had come in with reams of articles about crazy stuff and you know we we got a little book you know we had a you know file that was three feet tall by the time we finished writing those 10 episodes yeah yeah that that's right yeah and by the way i think because so many um so much of of television um uh, revolves around you know process people who are engaged in whatever the law or medicine or whatever um there is an enormous amount of room for for people who have the ability to write and then have this very interesting background. It just makes you an, an enormously valuable asset. Profession. So it's really been wonderful to have both of you here and to benefit from the experience that you've had. You're both trailblazers in what you do. Uh, you know, we're hoping to benefit. Uh, many years later from the, the, the paths that you have created for ourselves <clears throat> and for the next generation of, of students. And so I really want to ask everybody to give a, you know, a rousing round of applause and gratitude for your performance. So thank you very much. And thank you all for being here today. <laughs>